Two, we're going to begin in verse 12. If you have been with us the last couple of weeks, you know we've been in Joel, and uh, you probably think, well, that was a curveball, but we'll be in Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 12 in just a moment. You know, some of my best childhood memories were spent, as you're turning there, with uh, my maternal grandparents in the booming metropolis called Evergreen, Virginia. And uh, I used to love to go visit uh, who we called Nanny and Papa was Randall and Wesleyan Wooldridge. Uh, We were blessed. My mom was an only child. And so um, I and my two siblings were spoiled. We were the only grandchildren. And I really regret uh, my Papa died at the age of 66. Uh, My nanny died at the age of 62, both from cancer. And so in a way I felt deprived. I didn't have my grandparents. I believe when my uh, grandmother died, I was uh, 12 years old. So I didn't have a lot of time, but boy, they were rich time. In fact, the only thing I could think was negative about the summers I spent was my nanny loved to can, and she would go to the Appomattox cannery, and if we were staying with her, we were too young to stay by ourselves, so we had to go to the cannery, and I'm telling you, it was like a sauna in there. I mean, I I love the food that is canned, but when you're in a room and you have like 10 people canning stuff, you probably lose 10 pounds even if you're a kid. But other than the cannery experience, we had a great time. Our bicycles were at my nanny and papa's house. We lived right in town. Then when we were seven or eight years old, it wasn't safe for us to ride. Uh, There was so much traffic in town. So we left the bicycles at my grandparents and we rode all day and uh, we had a lot of fun. Yeah, I shared about my papa had party at night and y'all all were grossed out for him. It meant sardines and Vienna sausages for us. We got to eat better stuff, but we always looked forward. That was our late snack. Papa called it a party. We used to love to go to my great aunt's country store and I would buy baseball cards and it was so much fun. There were rook games. They loved to play rook. Rook was their game of choice. There was a ritual uh, every Saturday night. uh, Their friends, um, the Williamsons would, uh, Frank and Marion, they would go to Parkway Grocery at that time was also a restaurant. They would eat on Saturday night. They would come back and play Rook. And uh, they finished, though, by 10 o'clock because they had had church the next morning. And even though we didn't play, it was fun to sit in Papa's lap and learn to not divulge what types of cards that uh, he had. I love going to church at their church because it was less formal than our church was. And they had Sunday evening services and the pianist would play anything you wanted. And being a young child, I wanted. So I always would say number 131. There is a name I love to hear. I still remember the hymn number. And there were so many great memories. But there were a lot of lessons that I learned. But probably the greatest lesson that I learned was not a personal lesson, so to say, but I learned something very special to me about my grandfather, and it happened through a mishap that I caused. I was pitching ball one day. I had gotten this, you remember those heavy rubber balls, the red ones? If you're my age, you know what I'm talking about. They weren't Nerf balls. They were almost as hard as a hard baseball. And I used to love, I was about six or seven years old, and I'd throw it against the wall, and my trajectory went wrong, and I broke a window. And my papa was a building contractor. He was out working. My nanny had such a soft spirit, but she didn't No, she shouldn't have told me this. She said, I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to wait until your papa gets home and see what he does. That was punishment in itself. I mean, I was counting. It was probably three hours before he would get home. And my papa came home, and the first thing he did was he hugged me. And he paid to fix the window. And he said, boy, don't do that anymore. And believe me, I didn't do it anymore, but I learned a lot about my grandpa. He was a tough man, but he loved me. He loved me, and he gave me grace. He gave me mercy, and I was thankful for it. You know, we're looking today in Joel chapter 2, 
And we're continuing our study here. In the first chapter, we saw this great judgment that was coming upon the people. And then uh, we see in chapter 2 about this great day of the Lord, which was not only future to them, uh, but future to us. Now, day of the Lord in the Old Testament, uh, in those days, people often thought that that meant a day of judgment and day of judgment actually on godless people. The thing is, they didn't think themselves to be godless people. People. They thought by birth they were okay. And so we're seeing today that God's judgment is going to be a judgment on all of the people who reject Him. I hope today that you have trusted Him. I hope if you draw a circle around yourself today, you would say, I know that I know the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in Him. I give testament to Him. And I follow him. And so we know that this day is coming. And so as we look at it today, last week we looked at the nature of the judgments. And we saw all of, all of those. Today we're going to look at the nature of the judge. And it's going to be interesting as we look at the attributes of God. It may be that our eyes are opened in a new way to who God is and how God responds. Look with me at... And Joel chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. It says, Even now, this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. Who knows, he may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him so you can offer a grain offering and a drink offering to the Lord your God. Blow the ram's horn in Zion, announce a sacred fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the infants, even babies nursing at the breast. Let the groom leave his bedroom and the bride her honeymoon chamber. Let the priest, the Lord's minister, weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, have pity on your people, Lord, and do not make your inheritance a disgrace, an object of scorn among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, we thank you that you're a God who is far greater than our minds can grasp, yet you love us enough that you give us your word, and sometimes that word comes in the form of a warning. And so, Lord, as we uh, study your word today, I pray that within the sound of my voice that every person, every person has trusted in you, genuinely repented, and placed faith in you. Father, there's no reason that we should not be ready for that coming day or a day of death, Lord, if we have trusted Christ. And so, Lord, we, we pray you would speak in this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, the context is this. Last week we looked at uh, the attributes of or the characteristics of that coming dreadful day of the Lord, a day of judgment, a day when God is going to directly and unmistakably enter into uh, history as we see it. It's a day that will forever be unparalleled. And we looked specifically at some of the characteristics that this day will be unprecedented or unmatched. It will be unexpected. The, the horn will sound. And, and uh, as we looked at the uh, uh, emergency broadcast system alert, we talked about how people will be doing what they're doing, it tells us in, in Matthew also, and then the alarm will sound. It will be an irrepressible day. Once that day, and again, the day doesn't speak specifically to a 24-hour period, but to this short time frame when God is going to uh, intervene in history in an unmatched day, it's going to be irrepressible. It won't be that there will be a change of course, that it will march in line and, and, and carry out what it's intended, because it will also be an ordered day and an orderly day. And as sure as I'm standing here this morning, there is coming a day of the Lord. There's coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to return. That day is going to be marked by a blessed salvation and victory for those who have trusted Christ, but a day of judgment for those who are not. And so this morning, uh, we're going to look at God's appeal to the people here and to us. 
but also we're going to look at these attributes of God, five things that are true of God that is very important. These things are very important for us to understand, and hopefully understanding them, it will motivate our action. You know, there are a number of ways that we can be motivated. We can be motivated by fear. I can do something uh, for uh, fear of punishment that I uh, would uh, want to avoid, but I want to see, and I hope that we'll see today, these characteristics of God are so beautiful and so blessed that we would say, how could we not repent? How could we not live for a God who is this way? And the first thing I want to look at these five attributes is that God is a restraining God. You know, the God that we serve is a loving God. He is a God who is great in favor. You know, we, we, we take for granted so many blessings from God. You awakened this morning and, and you didn't probably, you thought nothing of it, but by the grace of God, you were allowed to see at least another portion of day on this earth. And, and so as we look at God, we're going to look at these great qualities of God. And, and the first I want to focus on this morning in our word is that he is a restraining God. You know, among all of the characteristics of God, one thing is true that God is not. He is not impulsive. He's not impulsive. He does things in an orderly and intentional manner. It is carried out with forethought. Even his anger, even his wrath is not like our wrath. Often when we become angry, we explode in anger or we, um, we dwell on it and it's, uh, we're absorbed in it, but not God. God is a restraining God. Even his wrath, if we could define it, is simply put his righteous response to our sin. So by his very nature, God is wrathful towards sin, but even in that it's a controlled wrath. A lot We saw last week a lot of the things that will depict this day, this coming day of the Lord. Uh, darkness, fire, waste, attack, terror, and dread. But the fact that God has not already brought this day upon us is a testament to his restraining nature, to his long-suffering Way. In fact, we look in verse 13 of our text, and it says, among the other qualities, that God is slow to anger. You know, um, patience in this way, slow to anger, is a great human attribute, isn't it? In fact, it demonstrates power. If you've ever been around someone that is a lost, uh, they're cool and just ranting and raving, there's very little respect for that. But, but one of an admirable twerk traits would be someone who can control his or her anger. And God uh, is long-suffering toward us. I, I want to share briefly two examples. And one is found in Jeremiah 27. We looked at it a few uh, weeks ago. And he admonishes the people there, serve the king of Babylon and live. And so as we look at it, you remember what was happening then, um, that uh, the people had rejected had rejected what God had been telling them um, to do through Jeremiah for years. And it's like they're going down a stream. And they're going down this stream. And here's Jeremiah. And he's saying, God is still with you. God is patient. God doesn't want you to experience the full wrath of his judgment. And so we see the restraining nature of God. And we see here that as they're going down, he's saying, give in, give in to the king and God will protect you. The other is found in Nineveh in the days of Jonah. And as we look at Nineveh, Nineveh was a godless city. If you were in Sunday school today, Daniel brought that out. And, and it's very interesting, the wrath of God, the people thought the wrath of God should go to the godless. But God was wanting to demonstrate his mercy even to Nineveh. I wish you could have been there this morning because those who were in Sunday school, you saw the wicked nature of this empire. 
and this rising empire and how God was going to demonstrate mercy. Now, showing mercy to his people was one thing, as Daniel brought out, but showing mercy to the people of Nineveh was an amazing thing. You know, Jonah was a type, he thought, God, you ought to just strike them dead. And, and those who were in Sunday school, you saw why he probably thought that. They, you know, God protect us, God judge them, they're wicked people. Yet God demonstrated to the prophet and to us through the word that even to this wicked empire, he was going to demonstrate mercy. And he worked through a reluctant prophet to do that. And so one of God's attributes is that he is slow to anger. Slow to anger in the days of Jeremiah when he continued to warn the people. And even after years of it, God was still saying, if you'll just relent, it will go easy with you. And he was slow to anger even with the nation of Assyria in the city of, of Nineveh. And how even though God sent judgment years later, that generation was spared. And so God was slow to anger. But I want you to see not only is he a restraining God, he's a holy God. In fact, he describes himself as the Lord, your God here. He's Yahweh, the one who is unmatched. There's none like him. He is distinct in person. He's distinct in character. And he is perfect in his being. And he calls us to be holy. Do you realize that? That God calls us both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He calls his people to be holy, even as he is holy. In Leviticus 19, and then in 1 Peter 1, 16, he gives this command. But it's very important for us to know, and it's important for you and, us, for you and me especially to know this today. Just because God does not immediately act towards sin, it does not mean that he is compliant with it. In fact, he's not. He's far from compliant. In fact, this coming day of the Lord is a testament to the fact, uh, this day of vast judgment, that God will deal with sin that is not covered. And it issues forth from his holiness. In fact, God's judgment and God's justice issue forth from his holiness. You know, there are many things today that are being accepted in the world that should not be accepted. There are many things accepted in the church house today that should not be accepted. And many, many people are embracing the way of the culture and more concerned about what people think, not offending people, than thinking about what is right in God's eyes. And we know that God is a holy God and will take all things to account. And so he's a holy God. But I want you to see a, a third attribute. He is a gracious and compassionate God. Verse 13, in, in the list of these attributes, it says, for he is gracious and compassionate. Last week um, at the closing prayer, you, you may not have caught it, but Brian Goff was visiting with us and he prayed uh, specifically about this. He said, God, um, one of your great things in the prayer is that you give us warnings and how God gave warning. A lot of people will say, how could a, a loving God send such judgment that this day of the Lord will bring? Well, God is loving and that's why he warns us ahead of time. And, and so as we look at it, and if you were in the Sunday school lesson today, and what a, what a great teacher Daniel is. But he brought out about Exodus 34, 6. And, 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 and if you remember that, the people had uh, built a, the golden calf, and Moses was angry. He came down and he broke the tablets that had the stones on it. Um, but God told him to inscribe, again, the commandments on new stones. And it was an issue where God was saying, even though the people were involved in, in pagan worship, that God was forgiving. And then it says in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's depicted here, as we saw in Sunday school. It's depicted in Jonah. It's depicted in Exodus. And it's an attribute of God that God is gracious and compassionate. Let me tell you today, there's hope for you. And that hope is not based on your performance. It is based on the grace and the compassion of God. That God's holiness and God's love and grace can and do coexist. And we praise God for Jesus Christ, 
who took upon himself the very wrath of God that was due us. And through him, you can have forgiveness today because God is a gracious and compassionate God. But I want you to see a fourth attribute. He is a merciful God. In God's grace, he gives us what we do not deserve. In his mercy, he withholds from us what we do deserve, and that's judgment. On that day that I broke my papa's window, he had a right to be angry with him. He had probably put that window in himself. He had definitely purchased it. He had a lot vested in that, and he had a right to mete out punishment. It meant that he would have to uh, take the time to put it back in. I destroyed what he had worked for, but instead he extended mercy toward me. Do you realize that your sin is an affront to God? You may not... You may not measure your sin in that way. You may trivialize it. It may be what you have said, may be what you have done, what you have think, thought, may be your lifestyle, but it is an affront to God. And as our holy God, he has every right to effect judgment on us. In fact, many of us, we're like Jonah. We thank God, why have you not already acted? And many times we are like Jonah. We're thinking, why have you not acted on them when it could even be us? But God's a merciful God. <coughs> My Christian standard study Bible gave a great illustration, the mercy of God. And, and I want to share that. And it's the wicked King Manasseh of Judah. Many people would say Manasseh may have been one of the most wicked kings uh, of all of the southern kingdom. And, and uh, history tells us that his father Hezekiah was a great king and had basically rebuilt all of the good things, had destroyed the high places, rebuilt all of the good things, and restored righteousness. And then Manasseh not only undid all of that, but did terribly wicked things. He would be in the hall of shame <coughs> among the kings of Judah. That's what the Bible says about him, not I. But, but in 2 Chronicles 33, verses 10 through 13, we see looking at that stream that we talked about for the nation of Judah as Jeremiah had preached and preached and even near the end of the fall of Jerusalem, God was still saying, I'm here, you can turn. Manasseh in his own personal life had rejected God and rejected God and rejected the prophets. But then he was captured. And in distress, the scripture tells us, 2 Chronicles 33, 10 through 13, that he cried out to God and the Lord was receptive to his prayer. And it said, so Manasseh came to know the Lord God. Manasseh was restored and placed in a right relationship with God. There were still consequences for him and for the nation, but eternally he was secure with God. You know what mercy is? It is a love that is not dependent upon the object of love, but is more descriptive of the one doing the love. That's God. Let me tell you, there's hope today. You may be standing in doubt. You may be standing in unbelief right now, but there's hope for you. And the hope is not based on your performance. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. The hope is based on the mercy and the grace of God that is found through Jesus Christ. God is a merciful God. Even now, if you will call out to him and say, God, save me, even as he saved that wicked Old Testament king, he would do for you. But I want you to see a, a, th a fifth and final thing. He is a God who is concerned about his name. Look at verse 17. First, we see this call, and we're going to look at the call to repentance is for all ages, all categories of people. But then it says in the middle of verse 17, let them say, have pity on your people, Lord, and do not make your inheritance a disgrace, an object of scorn among the nations. And then he adds, why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? In Numbers chapter 14, way before this time, God had desired the people to go into the land, the promised land. 
And when they were going into the land, they sent spies into the land. You may remember it. And when the spies went in, except uh, for Caleb and Joshua, the, the spies looked into the land and they said, the land is nice, but we're so weak. We look like grasshoppers compared to this people. And they reneged. They backed out of what God had called them to do. And God was very angry because God had paved the way. He was asking them to trust, and they didn't trust. He had just brought them through um, from Egypt, through the Red Sea. He had done all of this. God had done all of this for them, and they saw it with their own eyes. And then when it came time for them to go in the land, they backed out. And God's anger, which again is not an uncontrolled anger like ours, but his righteous response to their sin was incited. The people's lack of trust led God to say, I'm upset that I've created these people, Moses. I'm ready to destroy them and start again with you. Now, God never repented of anything, but he relents of things in, in Scripture. Moses had appealed, and his appeal was this. The Egyptians will hear about it, and let me paraphrase it, and they'll think less of you as a God. They'll say, he brought them out, but he didn't have the power to bring them in to the land. And so Moses was appealing to the name of God, to the character of God. And so God relented from sending the same disaster. So here in verse 17, God himself is speaking. And he said, why should it be said among the peoples or the nations, where is their God. In other words, if God's people rejected the warning and were judged, it would not only be to their demise, but it could possibly be for uninformed people, a miscalculation of who God is. God cares about his name. We're called not to take his name in vain, not to profane it. And many times we think that we're not to use the Lord's name in vain in our speech, and that's true. I can't stand when somebody says GD. It, may, it just makes my skin crawl. People use it trivially. But Christians, most of us, we don't struggle with that aspect, but it has to do with our lifestyle. We call ourselves Christians, and people look at us, and they say, if God is the God of that person, it must not be a great God. You see the life being a reflection on who God is. So Moses says earlier, God himself says, hey, listen to me, repent, turn, so that my name will be lifted up. So we see God's nature. He, he's patient, restraining. He's holy. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's concerned about his name. Now that we've seen how God is, what does that mean to us? What does it mean to you and to me? There are four commands God gives the people here that apply to us today. The first is found in verse 12, be urgent. Even now, even now. In other words, turn even now. This warning was for the people. This warning is for us. Don't put off. These matters are important. It's not that we can put God on the back burner. When God speaks to us and he convicts our heart and he speaks truth into us and we listen, we have the opportunity to make a decision. Uh, Paul and I were talking about it earlier this week. It's like flipping a coin. He said it can show up heads or tails. It can't stand up on end. Maybe it could. Rarely. I, don't, I haven't ever had it happen. It doesn't. It's going to fall one way or the other. When it comes to God, we can choose to go our own way and just presume on time, or we can make a decision right now, even now. God says that you can repent, that you can do something about this. Be urgent. In fact, notice those who were to be urgent weren't just the priests, although they were certainly included, but all the aged and the young, the newly married, every category of people were covered here. Be urgent. The second is be mournful. It says, uh, turn to me with your whole heart. And then verse 13, 
Tear your hearts, not just your clothes. Be mournful. In that day, a, a, a sign of remorse or regret or mourning was the tearing of the clothes. It would be a, a literal tearing of the clothes would be a sign. But, but God knew it's possible to have an outward sign, but not to have an inward change. It is possible for somebody to make an outward, outward profession of Christ, but never make a decision in the heart. And so he's saying, tear your hearts, not just your souls. Grieve over your sin. Grieve over the sin that has caused God to, to, to have his wrath toward you. And then the third thing, be repentant. He says, turn to me with all your heart with fasting, weeping, and mourning, all of those things representing uh, the, the regret. And then in verse 13, he says in the middle of that verse, return to the Lord your God. It is not enough to be sorry for my sin. I can go out, say, with Bob and get in an argument with Bob, and I can go home that night and say, God, I'm sorry that I got upset with Bob, but if I get up the next morning and do the same thing, those are just words. Repentance is more than feeling sorry. We can feel sorry if we're caught in something that we thought nobody knew. We can be sorry and then turn around and do the same thing. Repentance is a change of heart that is marked by a change of action. It is turning away from that. And, and let me tell you, the most important thing that we need to do is to turn away from a life consumed with self and turn to a life consumed with God. Repentance. The scripture says godly sorrow leads to repentance. But then there's a final B. Be mindful. Be mindful of God. In the last verse of our text, again, God asked that rhetorical question. Why should it be said among the nations, where is their God? What were the people guilty of? They were guilty of living their lives with a trivial, a trivial pursuit of God. Not a, not a consuming pursuit of God. They had a form of godliness, we might say, some of them. But when it really came down to it, they were serving themselves. They were trying to walk with one foot in the world and one foot following God. And today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your life should be a reflection on him. You carry his name. You need to be mindful of him. If he is your Lord and if you profess him as Lord, you should live as if he's your Lord. You know, last week I noted that God is money in the bank. Everything that he has promised or predicted in scripture either has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled. There's no doubt surrounding the events of the day of the Lord. Now, and we talked about within scripture itself in the Sunday school hour, how God progressively reveals in the scripture that the day of the Lord, the original understanding of the Old Testament was a day of judgment and a day uh, that was set toward those who didn't believe in God. But as we come to the New Testament, we realize that it, the day of the Lord is the day that Jesus is going to return. And he is the dividing point. And for those who trust in Christ, that day does not have to be a day of mourning. It doesn't have to be a day of regret. That it can be a day of victory. And it will be if Jesus is your answer. You know, God's justice and holiness is flowing like a rapid stream, not like the rivers would be now when it's been dry for three weeks. But if you take in the spring when it's really raining and that, that river is really flowing and flowing and flowing, and, and that justice of God is like that, the judgment of God, it's like that. But you know what? You can build a dam and you can take and absorb that water. That's what Christ did for you and for me. When Christ died on the cross, he died to take upon himself the wrath of God. He loves you that much. He's that compassionate. He's that merciful. He's that slow to anger that we live some 2,000 years after that. He is absorbed. He's taken upon himself 
your sin. Propitiation, that concept of averting the wrath of God, of, of, of taking upon himself what was due to you and to me. Do you realize Jesus did that for you? Then he took upon himself the wrath that you might be spared from the judgment of God. Have you trusted him? Have you said, God, it's not about me. It's about you. I defer to you. You're the Lord. You're the one. God, I have nothing when I stand before you. There's nothing. I'm a sinner. I may feel good about myself now, but I know I'll have that attitude later or say that thing I shouldn't later. Hey, we can't depend on ourselves on the best of days. But let me tell you, you can depend on Jesus Christ when you trust him today. There's coming a day, whether we're alive on this earth, the day of the Lord, or whether we come back with him. But there's coming a day when unless the Lord comes first, we'll all die. And all that's said and done is going to be this. Have you trusted Jesus? Is there evidence in your life that you trusted in Jesus Christ? That day is coming, a day of wrath, a day that will not be changed. But praise God, because of these qualities of God, because of the love of God through Christ, there's more than hope. There's victory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for how uh, all of Scripture speaks to these wonderful attributes. Lord, we could go on and on today about how great you are. But Lord, we know that there's nothing that we can do that can impress you. But there is something, Lord, that it says that all of heaven rejoices over, and that is when a repentant sinner turns to you, that there's rejoicing in heaven. Father, there's some within the sound of my voice today, they have never truly trusted in Jesus Christ, and today you're calling them to do that. Father, this basis is not based on their good standing in their own uh, efforts, but Lord, just saying, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. We thank you for Jesus. Lord, we thank you that he himself has taken upon himself the judgment that is due us. Father, there may be some believers here today, they have trusted you, but Lord, they've not been a good representative of you. As people have looked at their lives, and we look at the end of verse 17, um, and they say, Lord, if, if that's their God, what type of God is he? Lord, forgive us for that. For those of us who take your name, Father, may we allow you to live through us. And Father, uh, this moment, as we close the services dedicated to you, Lord, move in the hearts of any. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.